Good evening, everyone. This is Katie Kuhn, and I'm the manager of chapter and member engagement at the ACR. I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2018 chapter town hall. I'll be turning it over to our two presenters, Dr. Brink and Dr. Thorworth, shortly, but I wanted to do a bit of housekeeping before we get started. First, I'd like to recognize the Committee on Chapters, which is led by our committee chair, Dr. David Boyd, for their hard work and continued support of the ACR chapter program. Also, there are two important chapter events occurring that I'd like to bring to everyone's attention. First, all chapter recognition award submissions are due on Wednesday, January 17th. We have received a number of submissions, but highly encourage every chapter to participate. As a reminder, all chapter recognition award forms can be found on the ACR website. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact the ACR chapter team by phone or email. Second, the chapter leaders workshop will take place on Saturday, May 19th from 12 to 4.30 p.m. Registration is open, and new this year, registration is open to all chapter leaders, counselors, and alternate counselors. If you plan to attend, please register early as AC Limited. We are planning an engaging workshop, and this year, CME, ROI credit, as well as an ROI leadership summit meeting discount will be awarded to attendees. Now, for tonight's chapter town hall, please know that uh, we'd love for you to ask questions and participate in that way. We're going to hold all questions until the end. However, if something comes up as we're going through the slides and you have a question, you can type your question into the question box and submit it as a chat message. And we'll put all those questions on queue to be addressed at the end. Last but not least, this session is being recorded so that the information will be available after this session is over. We're happy to have Dr. Brink, Chair of the ACR Board of Chancellors, and Dr. Thorworth, CEO of ACR, to present the 2018 Chapter Town Hall. Tonight, Dr. Brink will provide a state of the college, what challenges we are facing, and our plans for meeting these challenges while continuing to grow and prosper. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brink to get things started for us. Perfect, Katie. Thank you. And many thanks to all of you who are joining us this evening. I know it's uh, uh, late on the East Coast and uh, maybe not quite so late on the West Coast, but I'm so appreciative of everyone uh, everyone joining. Uh, let me just make get things working technically here and we'll, we'll get started. Just one second. All right. So I presume everyone can see my first slide, uh, which is entitled the ACR Priorities for 2018. And we'll just get jump right in. So I'm trying to get the slide to advance here. There we go. So um, effectively, any organization uh, must be focused on strategy. And uh, the Board of Chancellors, of course, is very heavily focused on strategy. I'll be talking about uh, the refresh of our strategic plan, as well as some other important strategic initiatives we'll discuss momentarily. We'll also talk about advocacy and economics. Um, not just uh, preparing members for MACRA and strengthening our state chapter tools, but also we'll speak uh, a bit about um, the Anthem policy and uh, the college's response to it. In education, we'll talk about our annual meeting and our uh, efforts to promote the governance of the college, as well as um, uh, increased uh, support and um, a restructuring of the Radiology Leadership Institute that I think will make it a bit more accessible to more members. Uh, quality and safety, we'll talk about enhancing the robustness of the uh, appropriate use criteria for decision support, as well as enhancing peer learning opportunities. Um, and finally, we'll talk about diversity and efforts we're making to just increase awareness and, and make a difference. So strategic planning and thinking really involves a continuum, and I give credit to Tecker International, our consultant that we use for our strategic planning initiatives. Effectively, we uh, developed a strategic plan in 2014, and then launched a, um, a program assessment process, which helps us monitor and uh, our programs against the plan, a process that we continue to this day, uh, even uh, as soon as a couple days from now, we'll be doing program assessment again. But we did this in a big way starting in 2015. It's important when we have a strategic plan to assess our brand behavior and our brand relevance relative to the plan, which we launched an effort uh, in 2016, and I'll speak about that briefly. And it all cycles around uh, after every three to five years to have to relook at the plan and make sure that we're keeping pace with it. And so, um, in fact, we did uh, uh, readjust our plan just a couple months ago. So 
So again, um, the plan was adopted in 2014 with a three to five year look forward, program assessment and brand positioning in ensuing years, and then our opportunity for mid-course corrections just uh, this past fall. Um, let's talk a bit about brand positioning. Um, effectively, uh, I felt this was important uh, to address misperceptions that our programs are designed to increase funds to, to radiologists and the ACR without serving patients primarily. Um, the National Journal Review of Advocacy Programs uh, praised the college for uh, engaging uh, or uh, policymakers only when necessary and incorporating practitioners into our advocacy. Um, however, they also pointed out that one way to emphasize our relevance is to continue framing issues in terms of impacts on patients and um, effectively policymakers, policymakers still view our advocacy as emphasizing practitioner impacts, uh, perhaps more so than patient impacts. And yet we know that we have uh, established a, a commission on patient and family-centered care, care a few years ago led by Jim Ross and this uh, commission does a terrific job of producing resources including this uh, uh, toolkit to uh, enable practices to really focus on patient and family-centered care among, among many tools that, that, tools that they have uh, developed. And so how do we really address this misperception with our policymakers that, in fact, we view uh, the, uh, the work that we do to be extremely patient-focused? And that's really what this brand strategy task force is about, uh, effectively um, ensuring our brand uh, promise is pervasive, uh, persuasive, relevant, and personally compelling. And um, it's uh, consistent across stakeholder groups, including our policymakers. And we also want to question just how well do our uh, stakeholders know our brand promise. Um, and those who've experienced the ACR does the experience reinforce the brand. So I'm pleased uh, that we have a task force uh, led by Bill Harrington, our, our membership uh, commission uh, chair. Uh, we've engaged a, a consulting group, Heart and Mind Strategies, to help us develop a research plan to uh, look at our brand positioning uh, we've conducted stakeholder interviews and um, effectively that was completed just before the holidays. We're expecting a full report at our upcoming board meeting of this January. So stay tuned for more details about this, but I do think this is a very important initiative um, as part of our strategic uh, planning continuum. A re a closely related uh, to that to brand positioning is a conflict of interest task force also intended to address misperceptions that ACR leadership has complex financial relationships that influence decision making. Um, we launched a task force uh, in May of 2016, led by Geraldine McGinty and joined by Jim Rawson and Bob Pyatt. Um, a case study was executed this past fall, and we're looking forward to their recommendations uh, this January uh, board meeting as well. There is a uh, compelling uh, document that uh, is put forth by the Council of Medical uh, Specialty Societies that really helps provide organizations with a code for interactions with companies. And I think as um, time goes on, it's important that we continue to really make sure that we're being very vigilant about uh, conflict of interest and, and we're doing so under the terrific leadership of uh, Geraldine McGinty. So let's look at our strategic plan now. Effectively, why would we want to look at a plan and what are the reasons to do so? Well, there certainly are continuing shifts in our internal and external conditions. Um, we also have to look and see if sufficient progress has been made on prior goals and objectives. And uh, I recognize that objectives may need to be revised to make progress on a particular goal given shifts in the landscape. Um, and so uh, we executed a strategic plan refresh this past fall. We did reaffirm our core ideology. Our core purpose is to serve patients and society by empowering members to advance the practice, science, and professions of radiological care. And our core values remain unchanged as well of leadership, integrity, equality, and innovation. Um, we began our refresh by doing an environmental assessment, looking at trends in radiology and healthcare, which may impact ACR priorities along five broad themes, including the demographics of our workforce and membership, economics, professional structures, whether they be um, employed physician groups, private groups, academic groups, informatics, and technology. And just to whet your appetite a bit, some of the trends that we identified, just these are just a sampling. Um, we identified a rise in consumerism, which um, has a greater focus on price transparency and uh, eliminating opacity and what consumers see of our services, <clears throat> an increased focus on outcome measures and population health. Practice consolidation and service line reorganization is an important uh, trend for us to be re uh, cognizant of. And certainly the expansion of artificial intelligence applications and the opportunity for radiologists to define this ecosystem is so important. And then the rise of non-imaging diagnostics, especially in genomics, that could potentially displace 
uh, imaging related uh, diagnoses. These are just a sampling of some of the things that we considered as we approached our strategic refresh. And perhaps one of the, um, and, and the process involved a, a really a, a two-step process with the Board of Chancellors and the Council Steering Committee working together. We applied the results of our environmental assessments and reviewed progress made on our current plan goals. As a consequence, we uh, reaffirmed five of our six goal areas um, with a bit more expansive focus for the college, and we developed a new goal area for data science, uh, aka artificial intelligence or, or, more, or machine learning. Now, that data science goal that we added is about advancing data science as core to clinically relevant, safe, and effective radiologic care. With objectives of establishing ACR as a global leader for data, data science solutions, to define, communicate, educate about benefits of data science, promote radiology medical education needed to implement data science solutions, and to facilitate the development of artificial intelligence solutions free of unintentional bias. Um, we actually replaced a goal area with this goal. Uh, the goal of financial sustainability, we believe, could be moved to operations because we felt that we had made sufficient progress uh, on this goal so that strategic attention was no longer needed. Not that we aren't fiscally responsible, but um, that uh, we felt that this was really something that sort of moved to just our routine operations rather than being a part of our strategic plan. Other important goal areas which remain present include healthcare payment uh, policies and practice models. Our emphasis is on continuing ACI's leadership role and educating practice leaders and uh, members in uh, training. Our goal of uh, member and goal area of membership and member engagement uh, our focus is on member experience. This has been added to our goal statement with new objectives to maximize the effectiveness of the council, to enhance wellness among members, and to facilitate leadership development through uh, chapters and the council. Uh, for the goal area of radiology <coughs> and patient-centered care, our focus is on partnership with patients and families with inclusion of population health uh, management. And for the goal area of innovation and research, our focus is on patient outcomes and patient experience with new objectives to have investigate and promote precision imaging for diagnostics and therapeutic delivery systems and to increase understanding of the impact of the research uh, executed by the ACR. And finally, our um, goal area of external relationships, the focus is on the House of Medicine at large which, with inclusion of medical specialties. And some changes to our objectives really involve going from establishing relationships with patient advocacy groups to expanding those relationships in recognition of the progress we've made. And addition of international radiology organizations for strategic engagement and collaboration. Even though the ACR is, is not an international organization per se, uh, I've been been impressed by how much the international community looks to us uh, to exert and distribute the tools and services and knowledge that we gain to the world community um, and uh, look really eager to look for ways in which we can do that without compromising the major focus of our college which is on leveraging the dues dollars to support advocacy and economics uh, for the United States. All right, let's turn now to uh, effectively what the plan um, means. We revised and updated our plan again with a more expansive approach than our 2014 plan with more emphases on population health, some member experience, diversity and inclusion, as well as artificial intelligence. More emphasis on support for council and state chapter leaders. And we believe it is a strong and clear guide uh, for the college. <clears throat> Let me shift gears, uh, shift gears now and talk about the foundation, the ACR foundation and its strategic plan. Effectively, um, uh, in 2016 at a retreat, we, we really came together to really review the the purpose of the foundation, uh, our philanthropic arm, and our uh, retreat recommended and our board subsequently approved a revised focus for the foundation exclusively on health policy research, including the Neiman Health Policy Institute, as this produces research that directly influences policy. We believe this makes the foundation unique and distinct from other radiology funds and foundations, including the RSNE's uh, RNE fund, as well as the American Rankin Ray Society's uh, Rankin Fund. Uh, the Neiman Health Policy Institute, uh, Institute, as you know, was established in 2012 to study the role and value of radiology and radiologists in evolving healthcare delivery and payment systems. Its primary activities involve publishing peer-reviewed imaging-focused socioeconomic policy uh, research and uh, also to produce actionable imaging-focused information and data to support policy and practice as well as to, to support external researchers pursuing imaging focused to policy oriented research. 
the first two primarily are really very helpful to help inform our advocacy efforts. And there are a host of examples I could show, but just one um, uh, easy one to point to is uh, when MACRA was being, the final rule was, rule was being uh, developed, uh, we recommended that uh, 100 patient-facing patient encounters be used to designate patient-facing for MIPS participation. Uh, the original CMS recommendation was 25 patient-facing encounters. But by looking at the natural breakpoints in the data, um, the Neiman Health Policy Institute uh, recommended this threshold and a CMS uh, readily accepted it. There's a many, many other examples I could give you, but uh, suffice it to say that um, this is one obvious and easy one to point to. Uh, the HPI is about assisting members, and there's been numerous uh, JACR articles on MAPS, uh, MACRA and MIPS, uh, with information for practices to cope with evolving uh, payment reform. The patient-facing data set is another one example to help radiologists determine how they um, fare with regard to patient-facing considerations under MIPS. Um, let me turn now to uh, planning for likely scenarios. I find this to be a fascinating topic. If you're, if you're not terribly familiar with this, uh, strategic planning is done uh, really on a or, or near-term considerations of three to five years. Scenario planning is really trying to anticipate unexpected shifts uh, in the marketplace uh, that may have a big impact on one's organization, such as industrial consolidation and artificial intelligence. Um, the scenario planning exercises are intended to anticipate possible futures and react to them prospectively. As Bill Gates says in this business, by the time you realize you're in trouble, it's too late to save yourself. Unless you're running scared all the time, you're gone. Not the most optimistic quote, mind you, but uh, um, one I think that sort of inspires us to do scenario planning. Um, I had the, uh, the privilege of serving on both the ACR's uh, the scenario planning effort as well as the one uh, put forth by the Society of Chairmen of Academic Radiology Departments, but neither anticipated the potential impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning. But many drivers will push our specialty in different directions, whether they be macro or artificial intelligence or consolidated practice models. Uh, and so I felt a compelling, compelled to re-examine this uh, at our board meeting um, in 2016 where we took the SCARD uh, strategic plan and really dug deep into it, with, uh, led by Alex Norbash, Frank Lexa, and Geraldine McGinty. And it was inspired in part by a conversation I had with Van Moore, uh, in which he recounted um, his views about consolidation in a fragmented industry. He said, you know, looking at the tea leaves as radiology becomes disintermediated, radiology will lose its identity and its professionalism. BRAD started paying radiologists decent salaries, now they pay about $18 per RVU, about half of Medicare, they've already become a commodity. The venture capital companies come in with a five-year contract and that's it, often with much lower salaries. We need to educate radiologists on what it means when venture capital companies come into the equation. Um, Van's fond of uh, showing this slide, which sort of shows how the natural consolidation occurs in many industries. You can see over on the right-hand side of the slide that um, the shoe and soft drink industries or tobacco and so forth are very heavily consolidated with just a few vendors providing the bulk of uh, products and services. And back toward the left-hand side of the slide, perhaps closer to where we are as radiologists, uh, you see uh, industries that are just beginning to consolidate, but there's quite a, a long way we can go before uh, we may end up with uh, far fewer uh, numbers of providers or groups within uh, our demographic um, uh, with uh, increasing consolidation. I found that um, the scenarios that uh, SCARD anticipated were quite interesting. They really revolved around three axes of uncertainty, uh, market focus, the business model, and technology and science. The market focus uh, can vary between having a very centralized market uh, with um, uh, perhaps centralized by the federal government as compared to a more uh, individualized market where the healthcare system is based on open market competition. The business model can vary between a single specialty model where radiology profession is cohesive, strong, and efficient to a disaggregated model where our profession is splintered and highly competitive. And technology or science can vary between being enabling or threatening. Enabling is where the technology enables us to show our relevance, and disabling is where technology provide, provides significant threats from competing uh, technologies. And so uh, we really looked at three different models, uh, socialized medicine, entrepreneurialism, and free fall. And I'll just focus on free fall for a moment because it's kind of where you can imagine where sort of the bottom falls out of quite a number of things. And when I shared all this with Van, he said, you know, so the free fall model is pretty insightful, no outsourcing to India, but the business model not run by physicians will drive salaries down. Radiology will no longer be attractive to the best and the brightest. 
no money for supporting research. Deep learning will enable non-radiologists to bypass radiologists in some instances. The CT scanner will generate the images, but also a list of probable diagnoses based on the images. And so it's kind of a scorched earth sort of uh, forecast, if you will. But suffice it to say that it's this kind of thinking that at least makes sure that we're really looking with a broad uh, scope uh, into the future to make sure we're anticipating various uh, futures. As I mentioned, I was a bit disappointed that our prior scenario planning exercises did not forecast the, the impact of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so we're, we're embarking on a slightly different approach to this, which we're calling a strategic learning initiative. Uh, recognizing again that strategic planning tends to occur at three to five year intervals. And we also know factors affecting healthcare are numerous and fast moving. And so we need a way to recognize in real time changes in the environment, policy and technology that do affect our profession. And so we're leveraging re several resources. We have a new Office of Strategic Planning and Business Excellence at the college, led by Pam Meckler with a host of uh, talented individuals. We have a strategic learning committee, the same uh, individuals, Alex, Geraldine, and Frank, who will be doing this. And we can bring in data from external sources, such as from Frost and Sullivan on market trends and, and change drivers. And some of their snapshots look like this. I won't belabor this, but it provides sort of an external perspective on healthcare and other uh, more specific information that may be important to uh, radiology. And our uh, deliverables are going to be really this one year experiment we'll be reviewing and assessing uh, the Frost and Sullivan reports by our Office of Strategic Planning and Business Excellence and uh, an executive sponsored team, really along the same themes I showed you when we were doing our environmental scan for our strategic plan, demographic shifts in consumerism, economics in the regulatory environment, professional structure, competition, and evolution, artificial intelligence and big data driving new delivery models, and then Im imaging and interventional technology, both roadmap uh, and innovation. And so um, I think that this will be an, an important experiment for us to see if we can really leverage uh, so, sort of halfway between, if you will, strategic planning and scenario planning to give us concise reports semi-annually before our board meetings to make sure that we're viewing the future with a broad scope. All right, so let's talk about, about artificial intelligence and where we're heading with that. Um, certainly the number of articles that are being published about artificial intelligence for healthcare is increasing exponentially. And I think you'd have to be living under a rock not to have heard uh, a deluge from the, both the, the uh, professional um, media as well as uh, the public media. Um, suffice it to say that this broad theme is called data science. And data science really is about defining use cases for what we would want to use machine learning for, uh, curating data that can then be used to train algorithms that would ultimately be useful to implement clinically to advance our practice both for the benefit of our patients and our, our profession. Um, we recognized early on as we got into this space that there's a whole host of activities in the back end that need to be addressed by an honest broker like the college. And that includes not just defining use cases and setting some standards for data management uh, training and impl clinical implementation, but also talking about how do we educate both our, our workforce and our constituents about machine learning? How do we adopt uh, this and introduce it into our practice? <coughs> Excuse me. What are the standards and regulatory requirements? What are e legal and ethical issues? And that's really why we formed the Data Science Institute, an institute that launched at our annual meeting last May. And I'm very excited about the important role it will play going forward. It builds on decades of expertise and accreditation, appropriateness criteria, and practice parameters to develop standards and validation methods for AI applications. <clears throat> and we'll put radiologists at the forefront of developing and enhancing tools to effectively guide the introduction of AI into clinical practice. So I'm gonna take a drink of water here for just a moment. Excuse me, <clears throat> pardon me. And so um, really it's about ensuring the value of radiologists as artificial intelligence evolves, protecting patients, establishing industrial relationships um, to provide credible use cases and help with regulatory issues, and also educating uh, both radiologists and other physicians and stakeholders about the role that it can play for the patient benefit. Um, again, we've talked about the areas of focus, but I wanna highlight the leadership. We have uh, Keith Dreyer as our Chief Data Science Officer, Bib Allen as our Chief Medical Officer, and Geraldine McGinty as our Chair of the Artificial Intelligence Advisory Group. The advisory group sits within the Data Science Institute to provide input from a broad range of stakeholders to the leadership of the Institute in support of its mission. 
Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, as a ex specific example of how I see this going. And I'm going to digress for just a minute and talk about a, a tool that we call ACR Assist, which is about computer assisted reporting. And you'll see how I bring in or how AI and machine learning ties into this example. So computer assisted reporting is about providing uh, guidance to radiologists at the point of our care when we're interpreting studies on things that may be uh, forgotten to us when we're practicing uh, outside of our usual routine. We may not remember the incidental adrenal mass algorithm and or we may not want to take time to look it up on the web, but if we have tools that can bring it to our point of care and embed it in our workflow uh, when we need it, then it can be a big help to us. And um, big credit to Terry Alcazab at MGH for developing this tool. Uh, here's an example of using the algorithm for adrenal nodule. When you call it up, it lets you input through pull down lists, various uh, features of the, um, of the nodule, and then it suggests language for your report that you can import in. Probably the most important are the recommendations that we make consequent to the findings that we detect to ensure that we're practicing homogeneously and, with, uh, and reducing variation in how we practice. We found that um, uh, by using a tool like this, it can really decrease variability. We went from compliance with best practice for guidance for incidental pulmonary nodules on abdominal CT scans from about 50% compliance to over 95% compliance uh, when using uh, the tool. Again, it's not for every case, but it's when you're operating outside of your comfort zone is when I think that will be most helpful. I've been so impressed with this that I, in addition to the guidance that uh, is available through both the, uh, the RADs, you know, the TIE RADs, LIE RADs, TIE RADs, through the incidental findings papers and the Fleischner criteria and other, other uh, guidance out there, we've also been developing some guidance at MGH. And the one I wanna highlight for you, because I think it really sort of helps highlight where we're heading here, is the one developed by uh, our musculoskeletal uh, division at MGH for lumbar spine degenerative disc disease evaluation. And so they developed a tool that looks very much like the one I showed you. And you would only use this if you really didn't know you needed the help because it would slow you down quite a bit to use this for every case. But if you weren't sure what uh, to do with the finding, you could work through this guidance tool. Uh, you pick the level, you go through an answer, pick the, the features that correspond to the level you're looking at. And the major features here are, you know, disc degeneration, herniation, stenosis of the canal and the foramen and so forth. And you would go through and work through and pick the, the words that match the case you're looking at. But our musculoskeletal radiologist said, you know, that's a lot of words. Why don't we just produce pictures and do more of a picture matching game? So if L45 looks like it's a severe disc degeneration, you pick the bottom picture. And if it, the disc is herniating uh, like the bottom, you would pick that extrusion picture. Um, if your facet joints look like the severe one, you would pick that. And if the nerve roots being compressed or impinged, you would pick um, the, the one that matched most closely. Uh, for stenosis, so you pick the picture that matches. And as you're doing this, this um, grammatically correct report is building before your very eyes. And when I first saw this demonstrated, it kind of took my breath away that seeing this very, you know, war and peace of a radiology report being built by picking these pictures was kind of uh, astounding. I must say, I then realized that this is a bit anachronistic because when we produce this very flowery report, we're really forcing the reader of the report to go back through, read it, and then recreate the pictures in his or her head. So. It might make sense as we go forward to just embed pictures rather than you know, highlighting the features we're trying to show rather than make um, rely so heavily on prose. But let me now pivot, if, I, if you will, and, and pause there for a moment and now show you where artificial intelligence will probably come into play. If you think about it, the game we've been playing, this picture matching game, is really leveraging the biologic pattern recognizer we call our brain. And that brain is really composed of a whole bunch of pattern recognizers in the forms of cortical columns, each with about 100 million, um, uh, or, uh, totaling about 100 million of these, each with about 100 neurons each. So we have these cortical columns, which are really doing the pattern recognition. If we see a dog, we've been trained, we've trained from birth that uh, that is a dog, and we know it to be a dog. We're leveraging the neurobiology and the neurochemistry at the synapses, and even all the way back to the physics of electron flowing across the synapses to make that pattern recognized. Um, what if we wanted to try and train an artificial neural network? Well, we would go all the way back to the physics and replace the um, wetware, if you will, with uh, software and hardware uh, to do linear algebra and create an artificial neural network to replace the biologic network, uh, which is effectively what this is about. And it's about giving inputs, um, training a, a neural network through a variety of uh, images or other data to let uh, the network decide if we're looking at a certain object, a certain disease, or what have you. Um, 
One example I'm fond of showing, uh, which has almost become a commodity now, is the bone age classification. Um, effectively, one of the earliest applications is to train a neural network using bone age radiographs because it's such a standardized uh, thing with a, a clear standard uh, through Grulich and Pyle's book. And effectively, by putting through several hundred bone age radiographs, one can train an artificial neural network to a high degree of accuracy. Those that are SNA this year may know that there were over 70 un entries into the bone age um, uh, machine learning competition. Um, we uh, have one at MGH we've developed that is in use clinically in our reading room. Uh, and so this has now become almost passe uh, to use uh, a machine learning algorithm to help radiologists with bone age classification. And, uh, in our implementation, we still require the radiologist to look at the suggested bone age by the computer and make a decision uh, of accepting it or choosing one uh, nearby. Um, let's go back, back now to our um, lumbar spine example, and we're going to pick up where we left off. We, you recall we just discussed um, some guidance for radiologists at the point of our care uh, using a, a picture matching game, if you will. But what if we replaced all those features not with our observations, but with machine learning algorithms that would focus on these features, whether they be disc degeneration, synovial cyst, uh, canal stenosis, graminal stenosis, and so forth. And if each of these algorithms were to run on each disc level as the <laughs> images are being generated, we would populate a three-dimensional database of uh, proposed imaging findings to match the three-dimensional database of images. Um, this would be done rather seamlessly. And in fact, um, uh, without going into great detail, uh, the Center for Data Science at MGH and the Brigham is doing this experiment, and I've been astounded by how fast this is going. Um, they are now uh, quantifying this uh, uh, stenosis both centrally and in the frame and uh, and generating draft reports um, just from the computer uh, generated um, the computer analysis of these disk spaces. And so I, it is happening extremely rapidly, and I'm rather confident that there will be prototypes for this application and many others uh, in very short order. So what is our role and where do we sit? Um, I think it's really critical that radiologists sit in the middle of this process. Uh, the, the automatic feature di uh, discovery will be done and quantification can be done, but if we leverage that quantification to improve the precision of the report and the automated nature of this to improve the efficiency of uh, reporting, then our job is to ensure the accuracy of the findings that are generated, the relevance of those, because I'm sure we'll see lots of findings generated or draft findings that are irrelevant to the clinical question, and to really filter those into an actionable, meaningful report relevant to the patient's clinical uh, condition. So improving the precision of our work and the efficiency, but ensuring that we maintain our relevance uh, central to that process. All right, and so um, let me shift gears then, if I if I may, toward um, advocacy and economics, and um, uh, certainly pre preparing members for uh, MACRA and how physicians will be paid in the future is important. I'm not going to go into great detail here. We could spend a whole hour just talking about MACRA and what it means. There are a host of economic or a host of educational tools made available by the college that I'd refer you to. But suffice it to say that our macro work group really leverages the many pillars of the college, uh, our commission on economics, quality and safety, informatics, and patient and family-centered care are really integral to this, drawing on the tremendous expertise from the, among the staff uh, leadership as well. Um, our work group mission is to create meaningful opportunities for radiologists to participate in imminent value-based payment models that positively impact patient care at equal or lower costs. And this effort includes the development of models and measures that improve and grow the entire a profession to the benefit of our patients. Um, again, I'm not going to belabor it further, but suffice it to say that um, if you need any help in finding uh, resources to help you know how to navigate these waters, I'm sure we'll be able to provide, uh, staff will be able to provide resources at their fingertips for you. I do want to take a moment, though, to talk about Anthem's new advanced uh, imaging prior authorization policy, because this is something that's really kind of blown up, and I think it's important to clarify uh, the college's position uh, for you. Um, as you may know, Anthem really came up with some, uh, rather unilaterally over the course of last summer, uh, some um, steerage uh, policies that were rather draconian. And rather than belabor, the, belabor them on these tiny slides, I'm going to uh, sort of summarize them for you here, which is that they now require medical necessity and clinical care review for all advanced imaging in the hospital outpatient setting. Um, effectively, um, they will assess if the imaging service should be done in the hospital-based outpatient setting or in a freestanding imaging center, and will only cover what they deem appropriate. And out of the gate, their first uh, criteria were that 
they would uh, define medical necessity as when services are provided that are only available in the hospital setting, or if an individual needs obstetrical observation or perinatology services, or if there are no other geographically accessible appropriate alternative sites. Well, they have expanded this list uh, since it was first introduced, but suffice it to say, it still remains a very draconian policy that was applied unilaterally without any forewarning to, to patients. Effectively, the rollout occurred uh, in January, July of, uh, of this year to Indiana, Kentucky, Missouri, and Wisconsin. In September, it expanded to Colorado, Georgia, Nevada, New York, and Ohio. In December, to uh, California, and this coming March, to Connecticut, Maine, and Virginia. So our position has been that, this, uh, that we do oppose this very aggressive, economically driven steerage policy. But the point I really want to emphasize is that we would equally oppose a reverse steerage policy that arbitrarily moved patients from the independent imaging centers to the hospital setting. It's not about the sighted service that's bothering us. It's about the, the uh, unilateral steerage of Anthem to one site or another. Um, and regardless of where radiologists practice, allowing this policy to stand will accelerate the commoditization of imaging and a race to the bottom for reimbursement. It makes patients pawns in an insurer hospital negotiations and inserts an inexorable wedge between patients and their physicians and their radiologists. So um, we feel very strongly about this and hope you'll join us in fighting this policy. Uh, I, I like this cartoon uh, from Cindy Moran. I think that what is the true effect on patient care to cut costs, we've moved the clinic to China. Please take a ticket for your flight coupon, but maybe a little extreme in this case, but um, uh, uh, that's kind of how it feels. All right, so let's uh, turn now to um, a few other topics. Uh, we'll talk about education in our annual meeting. I'm happy to report that after three years of an all member uh, education focused program, our attendee feedback was clear and uh, we felt that our educational programming and council sessions competed at the expense of key council activities. So we've decided in 2018, this coming May and beyond, that we will revert to a council focus meeting very much like the AMCLC had been previously with limited additional programming, which will be primarily in support of chapters, so the resident and fellow section and young physicians. Uh, the new meeting program was developed by the council steering committee. It will be held on May 19 to 23. Uh, educational programming is limited, again, non-competing times, not competing with council activities, and the basic program to date is shown on the, on the right-hand side of the slide. Much of the, the feature is very similar to the AMCLC. Um, I'll shift gears now to the uh, Radiology Leadership Institute, and here we've um, uh, focused on career stages, emerging leaders, mid-career leaders, and experienced leaders, and we've made open, open up the content so that people can can choose a content that is most relevant to their career stage and to their uh, needs and their educational needs. Um, I'm happy to report that RLI uh, really has been highlighted uh, many times as the best radiology training program in this example by Aunt Minnie in 2016. The RLI modules uh, that were completed to teach ABR milestones, uh, I think are just fantastic. The economics milestone program is a terrific uh, uh, resource. Uh, I know our institution uses it for our residency and I get terrific feedback from our residents and our program leaders. If you do run an educational program, I'd encourage you to look at the Economic Milestone Program through the RLI. Um, let's shift gears now to decision support. And um, you may know that ACR Select uh, is the market leader with uh, more than 2 million provider interactions per month. It's been adopted by over 150 health systems and over 1,000 discrete acute care facilities. We integrate with almost every major EMR vendor covering more than 75% of the US population. Um, I felt that it was important that because of rapid shifts in this space that to maintain our uh, edge and to be vigilant, uh, we need to be competitive and thus uh, we've doubled down our efforts to smooth out any valleys that may be present in the appropriateness criteria to ensure that ACR select is, uh, is fully robust. Um, and also to help educate about decision support to our uh, referring physician base and to medical students so that the R-Scan program has been approved for part four credit by both the ABR and the ABIM. Um, a JACR featured series that was published by Max Winnemark on imaging stewardship in the age of value. This also helps get the messaging out about the benefits of decision support. I'm also happy to report that R-Scan has been approved for um, seven medium weight improvement activity credits under MIPS, and so our referring physicians can actually get credit uh, under the MACRA program. And um, Radiology Teaches is a slightly different tool. This is uh, developed for medical students by Mark Willis. 
and it won the ABIM, the American Board of Internal Medicine, Creating Value Challenge. So uh, a unique, unique uh, radiology program winning awards in the internal medicine sphere. So a lot of effort being put to helping uh, individuals understand, understand the benefits of decision support and guiding practitioners to the appropriate imaging test for a specific clinical indication. Let's shift gears now to uh, peer review. And um, the initiative here is really trying to go beyond what we know and love to be peer review to really add peer learning. Some have questioned the value of just uh, basic peer review where we, we all know what that means about reviewing another exam and uh, agreeing or disagreeing with the results. There's not a lot of interactions to learn for, for the original pro provider to learn in those interactions. Uh, the quality and safety community has highlighted this as well as coincidentally the Royal College of Radiology, which uh, has um, uh, been very vocal about uh, the benefits of doing peer learning uh, as a adjunct to peer review. So I'm happy to report that the college has provided an innovation grant uh, to um, Johnny Kruskal and his team at the Beth Israel Hospital to develop a peer learning tool that would supplement or expand Rad Peer. I like to think of it as a Rad Peer expansion pack, kind of like our kids use with video games. Maybe it'll be called Rad Learn, we'll see, but they're very hard, much hard at work trying to build out a peer learning supplement, if you will, to our peer review tool, uh, RadPeer. Let me conclude then with just a, a brief talk about diversity. Um, I borrowed this slide from some work I do in my day job uh, in which leading up to the, uh, the election this fall, it seemed like there was an escalating number of events that were just basic affronts to uh, inclusion and uh, civility. A uh, host of different events, which were, uh, I think, shocking to us. And honestly, since the election, it's been almost, uh, uh, we've become a bit numb to these. And um, suffice it to say, I think it's important for us to be really uh, focused on diversity and inclusion. Our Commission on Women Diversity have um, a number of uh, activities that I think are very meritorious. First, a uh, survey of attitudes and drivers will be led by Pari Pantara Pandi this year to establish uh, what are the barriers to a diverse physician workforce in radiology and radiation oncology. We conducted implicit bias training at our annual meeting this past spring in conjunction with the uh, AAMC. And a program I'm ex extremely uh, proud and impressed by is the Pipeline Initiative for Enrichment of Radiology. This is a mentoring program intended to attract women and underrepresented in medicine into the radiological professions by uh, engaging them early in their educational process, typically in uh, late undergraduate or early medical school, uh, and engaging them into a summer research project that um, is um, mentored and, and funded by the, the college uh, with hopes of following these students longitudinally to keep them engaged in radiology as they seek career choices going forward. We had our first class of uh, peer program students this past summer. Uh, Bill Thorwith was at the initial kickoff and uh, likes to, uh, is fond of uh, relating a story about how the leader of this program um, uh, made it very clear to the students that their first and foremost responsibility was to, to work hard in this program and not necessarily to uh, have a whole lot of summer fun. So uh, I think uh, she made a big impression and um, I was very impressed with uh, how this uh, kicked off. And so those are uh, the, some priorities I think the college is uh, focused on this year. Um, I hope this has been beneficial to you. We're eager to take questions, uh, certainly, it's all about leading and changing uh, together. So thank you very much for your attention and um, I'll pause there and uh, see if we have any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Um, Dr. Brink. Um, again, we're gonna open up the floor for questions. Uh, as a reminder, please submit your questions in the chat or questions box uh, located in, um, should be on your right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we do have one question as of right now, Dr. Brink, and I'll go ahead and read that out. Um, it's, a, it's regarding the anthem policy. Um, in states where the new anthem policy have already been enacted, are there hospitals losing a significant amount of imaging? I'm sorry, did you say are hospitals losing a significant? Is that what you said? I didn't quite catch you. Yeah. Losing, yeah, losing a significant amount of imaging. You know, I, I think it's a little too early to tell um, as the policy is still being rolled out. I, I don't have any specific data to know the impact it's had in these states where it has rolled out. Um, let me ask Bill uh, Thorworth if he has any more specific information. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much for unmuting me, Katie. Uh, no, yeah, we have no specific uh, financial information there other than a number of anecdotal reports, not so much on economic impact, uh, but as far as patients' concerns about being rerouted from radiologists 
and radiology practices in, uh, that have been part of their ongoing care of chronic disease. That's been one of the real challenges where they've been steered to facilities that may not have their old studies, that may not have access to uh, or uh, interoperability uh, with the hospital where they've been getting their care. So that's really been uh, a major, major challenge. I do think it's uh, the process that Anthem uh, employed in implementing these policies without any prior conversation or you know, apparent uh, concern or impact about the potential downstream uh, challenges that's really brought, uh, brought it to the college's uh, attention. And we're actually have a, a meeting scheduled with the Anthem leadership uh, next week to try to highlight these with support from a number of other organizations, including American College of Surgeons, uh, the American Medical Association, and others. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, thanks for reminding us of that. Any other questions, Katie? Uh, uh, Jim, I had two, two other comments I thought I might make, and one was you, sure. you mentioned earlier about the college's efforts to facilitate and uh, physician a radiologist reporting under MIPS, and I'm happy to announce that we just received word within the last week that uh, CMS has approved, uh, once again, the college as a qualified clinical data registry, a QCDR, allowing us to submit uh, the registry data on behalf of our members, uh, and also the measures that we submitted to CMS have been accepted by, uh, as acceptable as, as metrics uh, to qualify for MIPS uh, scoring, uh, realizing that the transition into uh, a full reporting of that is being done over uh, the next year. It gives all of our members the opportunity to really put their foot in the water and, and get uh, used to this accountability process. Well, thanks, Bill, that's terrific. I really, uh, I think it shows uh, just extreme um, value of the college's advocacy and economics efforts to make sure that um, uh, we make this uh, uh, compliance with uh, the quality payment program as uh, seamless and easy as possible. So thank you. Any other? Uh, if I could steal. Oh, go ahead, Bill. No, I was just going to steal one more. I'm not sure if any of our attendees were uh, any of the donors of the many practices and individuals uh, that uh, contributed to the ACR Foundation uh, over the last couple months. Uh, but I'm real pleased to announce that we exceeded the uh, uh, matching uh, challenge from the Advanced Radiology Services Group in Michigan and the ACR's Board of Chancellors so that uh, the uh, contributions were able to take full advantage of those matches and, full, and further fund the health policy research efforts you described earlier. Terrific. Absolutely terrific. Uh, Katie, okay, any um, other questions? Yes, we have one additional question asking if um, the Anthem policy is going to be heavily discussed at this year's annual meeting. Will the Anthem policy be heavily discussed? Is that what you said? Correct, at the at ACR 2018. Annual meeting. Um, you know, I, I, um, I am not completely sure. Um, Bill, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I don't think there's any question that will there will be significant discussion. I, we have, we're not aware yet of any resolutions that will come before the council. I do know that in the uh, economics program, uh, there was some discussion last year about steerage, and I suspect that that's even going to be stronger uh, this year because not only is this, uh, has Anthem been aggressive in policies related to uh, diagnostic imaging, but they've also have a policy on retrospective review of patient visits to the ER where they'll de retroactively deny that it was an emergency circumstance and the patients will be left uh, paying for that out of pocket. There's a, another uh, somewhat more complex policy on what's called the 25 modifier of procedures done simultaneously or on, on the same day of service of E&M services. So there, there's a lot of fervor that uh, I, I suspect is going to be uh, reported out to the council in May. Indeed. Thank you. Um, those are the two questions we received. If anyone would like to submit um, a question to be addressed, please do so. And if, um, if not, then we'll uh, go ahead and uh, finish up, unless Dr. Brink, you have anything else you'd like to um, address? No, thank you. And again, many thanks to the attendees tonight. Um, I really appreciate your tuning in. and. Um, 
I hope that you found this uh, beneficial, but uh, again, many thanks. So, and thanks to Bill for joining us and Katie for helping make it all happen. Okay, okay good then. Um, thank you again to Dr. Brink and Dr. Zorworth, and again to all the attendees. Um, as a reminder, this session has been recorded, so we will, I'll be making it available um, tomorrow for all chapters. So um, everyone have a good evening. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.